Welcome to Arc Photo Pod, the architectural photography podcast. My name is Jordan Powers, and I'm an architectural photographer based in the Southeast United States. In this episode, I sit down with Dallas-based interior photographer Stephen Carlish. Now, I've known Stephen for several years. He's a wealth of knowledge when it comes to not only the interior photography business, but also lighting. Uh, one of the, Stephen is known not just by his clients, but also in the industry as a lighting expert, especially when it comes to interior spaces. So much to so that Stephen started doing workshops earlier this year, 2023, and he has well-known, established photographers who use lighting attending his workshops to learn the way he approaches things. So Stephen is definitely a wealth of knowledge and I'm honored to call him a friend. We had a great conversation. It's a, it's a nice long one and I want to apologize ahead of time for the sloppy video. I'm running these things myself so I you know can't keep an eye on what's happening in the video. So they're a little grainy, a little noisy, but overall the conversation I found was super informative. So if you want to follow him on Instagram, you can do so at Steven underscore Carlish underscore photo. And if you want to follow his workshops account, you can do so at Carlish underscore workshops. And of course, if you want to follow me, you can do so at Jordan Powers without the bowels. Enjoy this episode with Steven Carlish. All right. So we've already been talking for a good three hours um, <laughs> about pretty much everything. Yeah. Welcome to Texas. Yeah. Thank you. So thanks for being on. Um, I guess, where do we start? Mm. What was the last thing we were talking about before we... I think we were kind of all the way talking back about weddings in the community. Mm, yes. we, were, we were talking about the parallels between. So like we'll bring people into the middle of our conversation where we were at. And maybe we can just kind like of. Weddings? Why are you talking about weddings? Yeah. Like, well, so you came from a wedding background. Did you actually start in weddings and portraits? No, actually. Um, so God, going way, way, way back. Um, you know, I was a typical dude who got into photography in college and wanted to be. Um, sports and a fashion photographer. So I was really into shooting. So I played tennis in college. So I was always shooting for the school paper, um, had my own dark room and I was shooting all the sporting events, shooting all my friends on the tennis team, um, trying to build like the sports portfolio and kind of wondering where it would go. This was in the early nineties. So things were like newspapers are relevant, like magazines are relevant. Like, yeah. so back then it was, like a career path. Yeah. So that was where I was kind of headed and fashion really interested me. Um, I mean, when you're 22, 23 and you're around the fashion industry, it's as a photographer, it's just one of the best industries I think to be around because there's so much creativity and so much going on. So see, I don't understand fashion. I, I don't, well, you don't have to understand fashion as a photographer necessarily to enjoy it. I think, uh, yeah, understanding the the whole world of fashion is now it's different, but back then it was, you know, you just show up and shoot, make it look pretty. It was, was it was yeah. I mean, it was it was a interesting time. Um, early nineties fashion world was was so different. Was that than it is now. was that here in Dallas then, or were you? Well, I was in Florida, and then I moved to Dallas. And so when I moved here, I worked in a camera store for a year, and then I started working for a couple of portrait photographers, and um, kind of. Did that for like a year and a half and was like, I just need to get out and work for commercial photographers. So I got into assisting and I started working at a fashion studio um, full time. So I was hired on as the studio assistant at a fashion studio and they had like four full time fashion shooters. And I was kind of like bouncing around between all those four guys. And each one of those guys was like a trooper, journeyman, like a studio shooter, catalog shooter. And they all had crazy lighting techniques and they all, you know, we had to light everything. We were in a big black box. Mm -hmm. So we had room sets, Duratrans, um, which are window views, based fake window views, yeah. um, things like that. It's all shot on film. It's all chrome. So everything had to be dialed in just perfectly, color balance. Um, everything was So was you actually, you worked as an assistant. Oh, yeah, it was, so how, I was, how long were you doing the assistant work for? I At that studio, I was only there for about a year and a half full time. And then overall, I would say I probably was a full time professional contract assistant for about six years, maybe. That's how I met uh, my wife. Was so you mean to tell me you did th these are the days when you couldn't just go to Best Buy, pick up a camera, yeah. watch a few YouTube tutorials. And I had a pager. There was no Internet. Get started with the <laughs> no. you had to, you couldn't just you had to actually go through a process, which I don't even think there was a Barnes and Noble then. 
There was yeah. pre Barnes and Noble. Well, there so had to have been photography books, but there were books. But you um, learn from experience and assisting. You you learn from going to the lab, hanging out with other photographers, and assisting and talking to other assistants, and that was your ne- your network was your educational. Mm resource basically or you could go through the photo school route you didn't do photo school photo school it was interesting um all all the people that i knew that went to photo school back then it was rit and brooks um some people went to parsons some people went to um art center Hmm. um it seemed like the people who went to art center kind of got out and started shooting in la okay and i think it's in la or well brooks was in la right no santa barbara so oh that's right and that shut down um, I really wanted to go to Brooks, but it was, it was kind of yeah. outrageous at the time. But, um, everybody that got out of Brooks, they'd come to Dallas and they would get into assisting and they're like, okay, everything I'm learning on the job is more than I learned at Brooks. They would go from, da- from Brooks to Dallas. Oh yeah. What was, what was, well, Dallas is a huge uh, photo market. Oh, okay. It always has been. And, but even in the, in the nineties, oh. it was a huge, um, catalog market, uh, product, tabletop stuff, um, Anna reports huge. That's so, interesting. I never knew that. So, oh yeah, why Dallas? Do you know like the history behind that, or why people would come here? Yeah, why was this the place for that? Uh, well, they were just. I mean, L.A. was huge. New York was huge. Um, you know, Miami, San Francisco, like those are the traditional. Chicago was huge, still is, but those are like the traditional photo markets. Um, and Dallas was just another one of the hubs. Okay. So, um, in this in this region, Dallas was it. Okay. Um, okay. A lot of great photographers. So in Dallas. Dallas is this. So photography is why you landed in Dallas, essentially, for the work. Um, yeah, it's a long story, but I ended up here in 1994 or 93 or 94. I don't know, some sometime around then, and uh, yeah, just wanted to live in a big city. I was coming from a small town in Florida and was either going to move to Orlando. I remember this. I was like, okay, I could either go to Orlando or I could go to Atlanta. Or I go to Dallas, and I still had friends in Dallas, and I was like, oh, "I'll just go to Dallas; it's easy." Okay, so, and that's how you met Kristen there. with the studio. Met Kristen when I was assisting. I had kind of been assisting for a few years. Um, we met in '98, I want to say, and she was a studio manager of a fashion photographer who had a killer studio. He was like the biggest, like hotshot JC Penney. Uh, <laughs> Fashion photographer, hot, hot shot, JC Penny. It was, it was like a thing. It was the thing. Yeah. Like it was back then. It was a big deal. Yeah. Um, I know JC Penny's not, you know, no, but you were, we're, we're any, back any in 93, 94. Is, this is in the, yeah. That's the 90s. So, um, I mean, we'd go on two week shoots. We'd, you know, have our little, we'd go out to the desert. We'd go to Miami. We'd go to wow. wherever these huge productions. And, um, it was a big deal. It was fun. And I learned a lot. And, uh, but anyway, that kind of, when I met Kristen, we decided to, well, she she was actually moonlighting at night on the weekends for a small wedding company in uh, like 98. And so weddings back then was like a whole nother, like weddings in 98, oh my God. Um, that was a weird, weird time. Everything was changing. And um, we got in, she was shooting. I kind of got roped in to shoot with her while we were still dating and, um, we actually started our business before we got married. So hmm. that's funny. My wife and I did too. We started a wedding yeah. in Portia before we got married as well. So, and we just did it honestly um, to make money, you know? Going back to the assisting part, like I just, I can't, and I don't think many photographers can wrap their head around assisting for six years as no, a, I know, a full time thing. People like, still, people are still full time assistants. I know career assistants. Hmm. And I know um, they exist. You just don't hear about them much in our space. Well, no, because now you have YouTube and you have, you know, online stuff. So, you know, anybody now can pick up a camera and learn and start a business. But you have to understand back in the film days, there was no Internet. So how do you market yourself? Mm. You know, how do you get jobs? Um, There's no digital. So, do you know, websites really really aren't a thing. Websites were just starting to roll roll out. I think we got our first. We did our first website in two thousand. I got my first computer in two thousand. Sent my first email in two thousand. Nice. At so, AOL. AOL. Uh, no, I don't even think I, I was always Mac. So I never right. never I skipped the whole AOL generation. Okay. But um, but anyway, my, I guess I guess assisting back then was was how you did it. And you can make a living as an assistant or as a studio manager, being a part of the photo community. Um, 
I don't know. There was a lot of business. There was a lot of opportunity um, were you to kind of have to, those types of roles. Were you able to still do your own thing aside outside of st- assisting? Yeah, but it was always like this transitional moment time where you're like, okay, I'm assisting, but I'm on all these jobs and I'm shooting on the side. And I'm doing this. I'm building my portfolio. Like, how do I break free and start out as a business? And that's why weddings for us was our out, mm. was our way to start a business, have a decent income, took a few years, but um, it was kind of a way for me to get out of assisting full time. Okay. So getting into weddings, so you met Kristen at some point mm-hmm. in that transition period. So I know you mentioned she was working for a high end, higher end studio. Mm-hmm. Um, how did you guys cross paths? Was it just in the world? She hired me as oh. an assistant. So she was his uh, so she used to be producer. Your, she was she the studio manager. Yeah, she was my boss. So. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I uh, got it. So she hired me and, um, yeah, so that was fun. Um, kind of hit it off right away and, uh, had to kind of keep it secret that we were even seeing each other yeah. for like six months. Cause it was kind of taboo in the industry. You yeah. Know, well, it still is. I think. Yeah. yeah. Um, but that was a, that was an interesting time, um, in our lives. So a lot of studio work, um, Fashion, 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 fashion. I mean, it's catalog fashion, but yeah. Describe fashion. so describe this to me. Like I said, I don't know anything about fashion. So essentially, a a company who makes clothes. Let's say designer, JC, JC Penney. JC, JC, JC Penney, Penney would literally hire you just to photograph models in their outfits yeah. in catalog for catalogs. Yeah. So a typical day back then would be, um, you know, you're either shooting on a. Uh, you know, on a room set or just on a blank, seamless um, background. And um, you would have a hair and makeup station with, you know, one or two hair and makeup artists. Um, you'd probably have just this kind of rotating, you know, either you would have a couple models there all day, they were just changing looks out and they would maybe do like 10, 15 looks a day or 20 looks a day. I don't know how many it was back then. Maybe it was like 10 to 15. Um, and so like each look was like a shot. And so, you know, as the assistant, you're setting up the lighting, doing tests doing Polaroid tests and all that kind of stuff. Um, working with the photographer and the art director and make sure everything was kind of nailed. Everything had to be perfect because mm-hmm. you're just going off a of Polaroid. Yeah. Right. And so the model would pop out, shoot a roll of film. Back then it was like everyone's shooting an RZ. So it's like, I don't know, what is that? 10 frames on a roll or something like that. And you would shoot like three rolls of film and that would be the shot and it'd be over, done, put them in a bag and onto the next shot. And so for those of us who can't wrap our heads around what it's like to not be able to see the results, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's probably a good 90% of us, maybe more yeah, in the yeah. industry right now. Uh, you know, I guess you, you, you train for that and you learn for that. Uh-huh. You learn to pay attention to those little blinks and things like that. Do you take safety shots? How does how do you get through? Well, that's that why you process? shoot three rolls. Okay. Yeah. So and you get one or two. I mean, you're usable images out of that. You or? just need one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So interesting. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's pretty pretty basic. Um, it wasn't like people were doing action sports and we had to like capture some amazing moment. It was you know a catalog model standing on a spot. Right. Yeah, and, doing and, this, and they know what to do. Yeah, right. they, yeah they've got the experience. Yeah. So, so it's an it's an easy subject for the most part. You're not, not you're not in uh-huh. a fast paced environment necessarily. I mean, maybe you, pretty fast paced, but, but I mean, like in, you, it was a, it was a consistent setup exactly. Pretty much each time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You had very a, you, repetitive, very yeah, process driven. Yeah, yeah. So then, transitioning from that into weddings is completely different. Yeah, weddings was uh, exciting just because of the variety of. Um, locations and styles you could choose to to shoot in and whatever you wanted to do pretty much was open game like you could try anything you wanted to do at weddings so i started you know during the film generation so it was like okay i started off shooting Hasselblad and we shoot black and white only and it was like okay i'm gonna shoot you know everything on a 16 to 35 you know horizontal you know just print everything with the sprocket holes showing and you know, get real, real edgy with direct flash. And I mean, all these silly things that just kind of push you to try different things all the time. Um, it was, it was fun. I enjoyed it. It was, uh, it was great. The wedding industry back then was a lot cooler than it is now. I think wedding industry now is just, it's weird. 
It's so yeah. weird. Well, it's it's be, it's become uh, Instagram. Yeah. Inst, inst, it's become social. Instagram. So, it's, social killed, yeah. it's killed the wedding industry, I think, for sure. The working w- in film in the wedding industry. I mean, how you had to have gone through hundreds of I don't even slides or rolls. What were you shooting on? Just color negative film. Color yeah. negative film. Okay, and the cost to just shoot a wedding oh, must yeah, have been astro- astronomical. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so I remember. Well, okay, so this is this is when I went digital, and this will kind of blow your mind. So this was like 2005 or 2006, and there was a camera. Canon came out with the One DS Mark II, which was like a seven thousand dollar camera body, it was sixteen mm-hmm. megapixels. I still have it somewhere. And um, we had a um, a business consultant who was working for us at the time, and we were still shooting film. And I had shot a wedding, and he was looking at our numbers and he's just like, he's like, why won't you go digital? Why won't you switch to digital? And I was like, ah, you know, just not quite there yet. Yeah. The camera's like this, you know, six, $7,000. And he's like, okay, the last wedding you shot, you basically had $3,500 in film and processing costs Wow. in one wedding. And this was 2000, like five or whatever it was. It's a lot of money. Yeah. Okay. So that, that kind of paints so, some perspective as well, because y- you know, when I started doing weddings in 2006, you know, the standard, the industry standard, at least where I was at in the Midwest was, you know, your, your basic package was maybe like $2,500. Sure. So you get, I think we were, we were briefly talking about this earlier, like the millennial photographers, when the digital cameras came easily accessible, mm-hmm. we could, you know, Craigslist became accessible. Yeah. Uh, easy marketing became accessible. So we come in with these lower rates. Yep. And you guys are used to charging. You'd have to charge at least double to shoot these weddings, yeah. I assume, if you're doing thirty five hundred dollars in processing yeah. and film film alone. Everybody kind of backed off their pricing though when they went digital because they felt like they were saving a lot of money. So they were they were they were taking that expense of the film and processing and kind of not increasing their prices to compensate for digital. They were mm-hmm. more people were like you said they were kind of reducing their prices because okay. this influx of new photographers, the the new young digital. Yeah. photographers who were coming in and ruining the market. Um, <laughs> they, you know, changed, changed everything. And then we started to realize, okay, dealing with a wedding digitally was a lot harder than dealing with it in film. So, mm. you know, I kind of missed spending all the money on the processing and everything because everything was perfect. So I would mm. literally get CDs from my lab with the images on them and I could just upload them straight to there was a really rudiment to Pictage. Remember Pictage? Yeah, I do remember okay. Pictage, yeah. Send it to Pictage. Wow. I used to send my rolls of film to Pictage. I remember when he could do that. Yeah. Because that was, st- I mean, I think it'd come out probably just not too long before before yeah. I had started. And Pictage was still kind of like the go-to yeah, yeah. lab for weddings. Yeah. That's really interesting. So, so these new photographers like me and yep. all my friends were coming in. It was very easy to learn photography at that point yep. because everything was digital. You could see what you were shooting. Mm-hmm. Um, YouTube still really wasn't a thing. So we were kind of learning from each other for the most part. And, um, you know, you'd have like the celebrity wedding photographers that were starting to put tutorials out mm-hmm. towards like the late 2000s. Um, a lot of traveling tours. I remember at the time, there seemed yeah. to be like once a month or something, especially here in Dallas, there was like always some huge tour like pictage sponsored tours and like yeah. album companies like, they had like smug the smug uh-huh. meetups smug yeah, yeah, yeah. remember those uh-huh. so there was i mean there were there were ways to to learn and and network and um get the information so that was that was interesting but you know i think at the whole time while we were doing all this and we were building the wedding side of our business we were still i was shooting commercially and i was shooting interiors which was a weird time to be shooting interiors in the, in the early 2000s um and we you know kind of laugh about it because we're like it was really hard to make you couldn't really make a living just shooting interiors like mm-hmm. you had to be a commercial shooter you had to be a catalog shooter um something else besides just strictly being an interiors photographer and there weren't a lot of people doing it it mm-hmm. was a small niche market um because there just wasn't a lot of outlet for it like you didn't have instagram you didn't have facebook you didn't have online people maybe had a website with like five to 10 pictures on there that um they would just let sit there for three to four years 
You so know. what were they doing primarily? Were they with this for magazine submissions? So I was always or? shooting for magazines. Okay. So my start in shooting interiors was strictly for magazines. Like I was getting hired only by the magazines. And then after a while, designers would start hiring as people started having websites and they mm. needed content. Um, then designers would start hiring me directly. Okay. But I would say for the first couple of years, all my interior shoots that I did were, I mean, 100% for magazines. Hmm. So how did interiors come about in the first place? You're doing weddings, you're doing studio stuff, fashion. Yeah, well, it's, you know, when I was when I started off in college, I started off as an architecture student. So I was a, oh. my major was architecture. I got to my junior year. And I just was like, this isn't for me. And um, I wanted to change paths completely. And so dropped out of architecture school and wanted to get into photography. So I got into art school and picked up a camera. And mm. that's the transition into, into photography was my falling out of love of wanting to be an architect. And I always had that as a background. Like architecture was sort of in my brain as um, something I always wanted to be an architect since I was mm. a little kid. Um, something I always loved, appreciated, and you knew the history of and knew the basics of and all that kind of stuff. But it was, was it more just the visualization of architecture or was it more? It's the idea of Obviously it wasn't the process. The process was yeah. not, not for me. Okay. Um, I can't sit still that long. Um, had a hard time just doing the projects and completing them. I had great ideas, but just the whole execution of it was just not my forte. Mm -hmm. And I was like, this isn't going to work for me. Um, I need something that's quicker, faster, you know, faster pace, a little bit more yeah. instant gratification. So um, I didn't get into photography to photograph architecture, but I always enjoyed it. I would mm -hmm. take pictures of architecture and all that kind of stuff. But when I started shooting interiors was um, one of the first magazines that used to hire me hired me to do portraits because I had all this background in fashion and working for portrait photographers. That was like my first love was portraiture. So I was really pushing the portrait angle pretty hard early on. And so I was getting hired to shoot people, these editorial portraits. And a lot of times it was like a store owner um, or somebody like a chef in a restaurant or, you know, somebody business portraits or whatever. And it was always, the instance where they were like, okay, take the portrait, but then also do a couple interiors while you're there, just so we can have something for the story. If we need an interior to run next to the portrait, whatever. So I would go and I would shoot the portrait and I would shoot a couple interiors. And then after a while, this one magazine that I was shooting for a lot, um, they had interiors as part of their magazine. And hmm. they said, do you want to shoot a full interior spread? And I was like, sure. I was like, what does that mean? <laughs> like, sure. you know, what do I do? So, you know, it was like, okay, super nervous and going through uh, old, you know, design magazines at the time, like Southern Accents and. What, um, sorry, what year was this ballpark? Like 2000, okay. 2001, right. somewhere around there. And, you know, I went and shot, I didn't know what I was doing. Um, it was crazy, but, you know, ran as a full feature. It was huge, you know, print, it was an oversized print mm -hmm. magazine. It was like amazing. And, Anyway, I was hooked and I was like, okay, this is, this is, this is cool. This is something that I like, something I appreciate. Um, I think I could be good at. And, uh, anyway, so that's, what's kind of started me into pursuing more interior jobs. And then, you know, one editorial led to another, led to another. And after a while I was like, you know, that was what I was getting booked for hmm. was shooting interiors. So walk me through like, just briefly, what did that, what did shooting interiors look like back then? Oh, like, in, a, in, like the, a typical in, shoot? In the beginning, for you, what did oh. that look like? Um, Just, chaos. Yeah. <laughs> Lights everywhere. So, or? you know, it was interesting. It was it, compared to these days where everybody's flooded with imagery and ideas and um, too much information. Back then, there was there was nothing, nothing clouding my, my vision at all. So I would go into a shoot completely blind. Um, with no preconceived ideas of what a great shot would be or anything. So I was truly experiencing like the space and the moment, like as a photographer, which you just can't do these days. I mean, you just yeah. can't walk into a space without having some kind of preconceived idea of what you're going to do and how you want to shoot it. And what do you want, what do you want it to look like? Um, back then it was just all fresh and new and exciting in, in a certain way because I didn't know where I was. I didn't know what I was going to get to see when I got there. I didn't pre-scout. It was like, show up at this address on Wednesday at nine o'clock in the morning and shoot, shoot mm. the house. And, um, you know, it was all film. I started off shooting. I 
was shooting four by five, which was crazy. Um, I thought you had to shoot four by five. We need, needed to shift lenses. And so I was shooting four by five color neg, which was a mess. Um, RZ, I have a Fuji 680 that I used to shoot roll film on. And you, you was know. that what you were just shooting with? Yeah, recently? I still have it. Yeah. I'm still shooting it. Yeah, shooting it again. It's fun. Um, but yeah, I needed a shift lens and that was the camera that could give me roll film with shift lens. And, um, what were it was you, fun. If you could go back it, just on one of those shoots, like what was it that you were looking for? I was I, looking I, for cool shots, okay. you know, and, uh, it was weird uh, as, was, you know, now it's, um, when I walk into a shoot now with a designer and, um, a stylist and, you know, it's, it's okay. Well, we got to get the one point perspective of the kitchen with the Island and we got to get the, you know, the overall of the, the primary suite. Night, it's like, like, everybody kind of has these canned shots that they want to get yeah. of a shoot and you know, the angles, you know what they want to see. And, you know, I get PR companies will send me emails and they're like telling me, make sure you get this type of a shot. We're going to need to see. And I'm just like, okay, that takes all the creativity out of it. Mm. Like they're already wanting it to look like something else that they've already seen. And then taking out the whole opportunity of, of doing something unique and creative on a, on a photo shoot just because they want to go for something safe, which I don't know, it sucks. But um, not every client is like that, but you know, enough are to where it, yeah. That's you know, become it's hard. The job. It's hard. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, and, and most of the people that I see starting off right now in the world of interiors, I mean, they're mimicking what they see online. So it's just this endless flood of sameness over and over and over again. And it's almost like, OK, everybody needs to get past this step. Like designers need to get past it. Photographers need to get past it. And that's when you start to see some really amazing work is the people that have gotten past that basic idea of, you know, what's expected mm -hmm. and what can they create something that people haven't really experienced yet or seen yet. So, so when you were looking for stuff that you thought was cool, uh, was it light at that point? Was it just, was it objects? Was it the space itself? Like, what was your idea of core? Or was it just anything that caught your eye? You were capturing that how you could. I sort of had like an epiphany around composition um, early on where I kind of had this aha moment where I felt like I understood the composition of what made a shot great. And there was like this, this clarity to it. It's hard to explain, but um, you know it as a, as a photographer shooting architecture, even shooting real estate how easy it is to kind of get in this sort of mode where you're just kind of showing everything where you're, you're, you're shooting, you're covering your bases. You're shooting this angle, shooting that angle, shooting this angle, whatever. And you're just kind of going through the motion and you don't really see the beautiful shot. You mm -hmm. just are making sure it's done. And, um, I actually realized I had gotten to this point where I was like, this feels right. This is the shot. And I was able to repeat it over and over again in every shoot that I went on. And so there were things that I was looking for um, compositionally, spatially that made sense to me that I knew those were the moments, those were the shots that I really excelled at. And those were the shots that people were gonna enjoy and like. So I needed more of those. So it was that type of situation. Lighting came in later. Okay. You know, and we were talking about it earlier, like I've been lighting my stuff since day one. I mean, every, thing I was on in the mid nineties till, till now it's all revolves around lighting. Mm -hmm. And, um, I really didn't start to understand how powerful lighting could be until the last couple of years when I really dug in the last couple of years from now. Yeah. yeah. Oh really? yeah. I mean, I've been using lighting and have been lighting things like crazy for years and years and years, but the way I understand it and the way I use it now is completely different than what the way I was using it even two or three years ago. Mm -hmm. And that's interesting because I think it's probably been about four years since I first stumbled across your work, I think. So I wonder if there's any kind of correlation with that. I mean, I you, you've been posting since before that. You've been sharing and pretty active, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I thought I knew everything about lighting 20 years ago. Yeah. Huh. Well, <laughs> what a, was it? It's an evolution. I mean, you always keep learning. What was it recently? I mean, over the last few years, that what was the epiphany you had or the... Um, the real, I mean, you've been using it, but what's, what's changed? I, th I think 
understanding that I can control the entire look of a shot with my lighting. Mm. I can control the mood. I can control the contrast. I can control everything with how I decide to light it. So if I want to shoot to have a certain vibe and energy to it, I can light it a certain way and I cannot light it. You know what I mean? So mm-hmm. it's like I, I can choose to do things in different situations. It's not just a tool to save my ass when it's dark or if there's no light in the room. Um, it comes in handy when those situations are mm-hmm. like that. But it's something that I will use to overpower the daylight if I want to or if I want to bring attention to something in a room, um, highlight something in a certain way, um, create the depth that just doesn't exist in reality. Mm-hmm. So I enjoy that process of sort of sculpting this this image based on how I want it to feel. Mm-hmm. If that makes sense. Yeah, it does. So how, how are you, what is that process? I mean, I know it's going to be different. It's kind of, a, you can't really answer it with one yeah. blanket statement, but what does that look like in real time? Like you, are, do you go into, like you said, a lot of the clients probably already have a preconceived idea of yeah. what they want. Yeah. But at what point does your vision, I guess, come into that where you're deciding what you want it to look like? Like, how does that, does that just happen in real time? It, yeah, yeah, pretty, pretty okay. much. I mean, when I, you know, I go through this, this process of, of finding the shot visually um, through scouting, through observing, through, you know, looking through my camera. Um, but once I've zoned in on, on my shot, then it's what do I want this shot to look like? You know, I can take an ambient frame, check it out on my computer and, and evaluate it and say, okay, all right, this is what I see. This is what I'm getting from this space. And it's like, now how can I bend it to what I want to see and do I need to? So Mm -hmm. I can push it a hundred degrees one way, or I can go the other way depending on on what I want it to look like. And, you know, if I'm shooting for a type of a designer that, that wants a certain look and a certain style and maybe the natural light just isn't there, it's not giving it to me, I can, I can create that look using lighting. So, so there's this, I don't, I don't, I'm not, I'm not somebody who likes to over intellectualize photography. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying there's not a place for it, but I'm just, I'm so simple when it comes to it. I'm kind of like, I look at something and I respond to it and I kind of leave it at that. Sometimes mm-hmm. I'll use light. It's, it's it's kind of just that I use it to either solve problems or create something that I don't see there. So I think at a very basic level, I can see where you're coming from. What I, what I'm curious about is do you think that by having that many tools, like does, does it take away from having a consistent style, if you will? No, I think it creates a consistent style. Okay. Even though you're able to like kind of change it based on the scene, like, like, do you, oh, I change it, but I mean, I, I do fall into a similar pattern of lighting okay. because I've, there are certain things I like to do. It's Got like it. being a chef who cooks a certain way, uses certain type of ingredients, um, kind of is known for a certain taste and flavor of how they cook. Got it. Um, I think that's, to me, that's what lighting is. Do you think that um, t- to your clients is the, is your, Obviously, they're looking at the fun, the results and mm-hmm. your reputation, obviously. But like, what do you think they? Do you think people are responding to your process or to your results more? I, I it's a hard question to answer, but um, I think it's a little a little of both. Yeah. I think people respect my um, expertise, I guess, mm-hmm. and and knowing how to get something when maybe the conditions aren't great. Um, like it doesn't matter what doesn't matter situation if it's rainy or if it's sunny it or whatever. Like I can handle it, and they yeah. they know I'm gonna deal with it quickly and efficiently, and and and, and get a great shot. Um, you know, I'm I'm a huge fan of natural light, and I'm a mm-hmm. huge fan of waiting for that perfect moment when the sun peeks through behind a chair and streaks across the floor and hits the leg of a table or something like that, and it's just like amazing, right? Um, and I'll capture that when it's there. <laughs> I can almost I can almost finish your sentence because I'm I'm like agreeing with you as you're getting ready to say it. Yeah. And <laughs> I am just not the kind of person who wants to leave my shoots to chance. Yeah. So I feel as a professional, I have to deliver a product to my clients. I have to give them something. They have to walk away with great images, mm. regardless of what what was happening that day. Um 
time constraints, time of year, yeah. um, whatever. And um, I mean, there's a million ways to manipulate light, mm -hmm. and you can you can control the ambient out your wazoo. Um, a lot of lot of tricks, a lot of tools for that, and you know. Some things you can do faster one way versus another way mm -hmm. and get to the result you want. So I feel if you understand how to light things, either with LEDs or with strobes, uh, a certain way, you can get there really quickly. Are you using LEDs? Not yet. Okay. No, not yet. No. So you've got some plans to, to try and maybe work them in your... I like, I like LEDs. Um, the kind that I want to use are still a little cumbersome for me. So mm -hmm. they're going to slow me down. Mm. And I don't want to deal with the the weight and the size mm. aspect of it. But so, I do think they're amazing. Yeah. So um, going back to like the process part of things. So I respect that. So I, I think for me, so I'm in this weird, like I said, I, I'm, I do a lot of thinking out loud. So it's a lot, a lot of times I'm like, yeah, I just, I'm primarily shoot natural light, but it's like, if I get into an argument with somebody, I'm going to say, no, you need, you need to use light because you need to be able to make the photo look how you yeah. want it to look. So I can, I can see both sides of everything. Um, also one of the benefits of being able to know this stuff is, you know, if you're, if you're there to shoot 10, 10, 10 images, um, what if the light doesn't show up later in the day? It's like, you need to know how to resolve for that. You know, mm -hmm. so it's like you can't just anticipate. Like a good example, when I was out there assisting Simon, mm -hmm. we were there for 12 and a half hours. And it was Southern California. You'd expect it to be sun all day, but it was cloud and overcast all day. We literally had to just wait for the sun to show, to show up. But we could have been done with that shoot in four hours had we just been using light. You know, well, yeah, you could have, but it wouldn't look like Simon's work. It wouldn't have. <laughs> so but, that's, that's the problem. Yeah. yeah. But, but I think what I'm getting at is like, you know, to have, and I'm not, obviously he's not doing anything wrong. It's a, that's the way he does things. And it's the way I do things a lot too. Yeah. But there's a lot of wasted time. You know, if, if I was maybe doing a combination of those things, which is kind of where I'm like leaning towards, like, yeah. you know, I've got my shots where I, I can bring light in and I can make them look the way I want. And then in between that, during the downtime, I can go and, you know, play around with whatever's happening naturally. You know, I think there, there could be a happy medium there, but I don't know enough about light to like, I know how to make a couple different things happen that I want to happen. Yeah. I know how to make shadows. Sure. Cast pretty, pretty <laughs> simply. Yeah. Um, I know how to make, uh, something look soft in just a little small area if I want to, mm -hmm. um, but I, I'm like, I have like three or four tricks that I know. Like if you, I'm not saying tell yeah. us how many tricks you have, but it's like, what's Well, I think good... you need to know them all. I think yeah. it's fun. I, so I've been doing this since 91, um, got into photography. So I still feel like every, every time I go to a photo shoot, even now I still feel like I'm, I, I try something maybe a little differently or I mm. try a different modifier, a different way or whatever. And it's, I understand what it's going to do for me and I'm going to try it to get a certain result that I want. Um, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work, but I can easily, easily revert back to something I know is safe. Um, but it's fun. It's like, a, you know, it's, it's, it's a creative exercise. It's, it's a game. It's not, um, you know, if, if, if I was the guy who just walked in with a camera on, on my tripod on, you know, just walked around and, and shot natural light. That's, that's great. There's a lot of people who do that. Mm -hmm. Very successful. And they shoot great projects and they get great light sometimes and they get great images and, and it's all beautiful. And it's a ha everybody's happy. And, you know, I, I wish sometimes I was like, that would be really nice. You know, I'd love to fly to, you know, New York city and Paris or something. And just with a little carry on bag and a little travel tripod, and, you know, just, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, be that photographer for a moment. Right. Yeah. But I, maybe it's because I have a commercial background um, and I started with film and everything had to be perfect and everything had to work. Like if you, you didn't get a, you had a full crew on a commercial shoot and the light's not quite right, but they kind of want this sunny day vibe on the photo shoot. You had to make it a sunny day. Mm. You know, there's no, you, you don't, you don't wait. You don't, you have a crew of 30 people on set spending the client, spending a fortune, you know, to be there for one day. And it's like, you got to make it happen. Mm -hmm. So I think that stress early on 
taught me all these different ways to make something out of nothing. You're also pointing out a good, you were showing me a book earlier um, and you're pointing something out that you, you've, I've heard you say before, but I don't think it registered until I had the actual book in my hand and you were saying it as I'm flipping through, you were talking about like, it's, it's not so much the space that's the, it's, it's the details. It's the, the products used in that space that yeah. a lot of times is what you're, you're concentrating on. Yeah. So I think, you know, to that point, you, you also can't just wait around for a particular product that you're trying to highlight to be naturally lit. You have to figure out a, you have to have a, a crafty way to, yeah to make that. Or maybe you want a certain object in that room to stand out more than something else mm. because that's the important piece. And that's, that's the piece that the designer really wants to showcase, you know? Um, we're going to get into it, but like, what's your, do you have a, um, kind of a process of elimination that you go through when it comes to like setting up a scene? I mean, do you kind of start, do you look well, yeah, at the yeah, scene? Yeah. Sure. What, 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 what am I seeing? What do I need to add or subtract? Like how, what's the process kind of process? Number one is, um, I always scout a location if I can. Um, you know, I mean, a lot of people, I know this, I hear, I hear both sides of the story of people who like to scout and people who just want to walk in fresh. And like I said, I've, I started that way where I walked in, you know, yeah. blind basically mm -hmm. to a photo shoot. And I think, um, I live in Dallas. A lot of houses that I shoot are, you know, 10,000 plus square feet. And just when I show up to a shoot for the first time, if I haven't been there before, just walking the house could be a good 45 minutes yeah. with a client. Um, you're not getting your first shot off until 9, 30, 10 o'clock in the morning. You've lost all the good light, mm -hmm. you know? And then you're like, then you're racing against the clock. You mm -hmm. know, it's like, boom, boom, boom. Let's order lunch. And you've got like three shots in the can. You're like, oh God. So I'll pre-scout set up a series of shots that I want to do that I know I want to accomplish for that designer. It could be 15 shots, 20 shots, 25 shots, whatever I can, I can do in a day mm -hmm. based on the parameters of what I'm shooting, who I'm working and with. And do you do that based on the scout as well? The scout dictates what I think we can get done in a okay. day. So, and that's a collaboration between me and the designer and whether or not they're using a stylist or not. So sometimes uh, I'll be working with some stylists where I'm like, okay, that stylist that I'm working with likes to preset a room and walk away mm. and is not going to really kind of worry about maybe the placement of things as much as another stylist who will be there and actively be positioning things as I'm shooting frames and making it perfect. Um, so I, some stylists I work with, I'm like, okay, I could probably do this many shots a day working with this person versus with this person, I maybe get a little, couple more shots, whatever. Mm. Um, so I kind of have a plan going into it. Um, I'll know where I want to start uh, based on the light. And I'm assuming I'm going to get great natural light. So I'm going to plan my attack on the house based on the best light I can get different times of the day. So I've got my my shot list and I've got my, my plan. So and I already know kind of where I'm going to be. So I've got these ideas in my head of where the camera's going to be based on the lighting that time of day. It should be here, should be there. Maybe taking um, notes of where furniture is and little things you want to highlight. Exactly. Yeah. What I want to see, what I don't want to see. And um, and I get in there and I evaluate the natural light first. Well, I got my shot, evaluate the natural light. And then it's just, it's a matter of, do I want to manipulate the natural light to get the look I want? Or do I want to use strobes? Mm. So, and that's when I start to decide what's the actual quality of light that I want in the shot to differentiate between manipulating the natural light and using strobes. You, you're talking about using scrims flags. Exactly. You know, yeah. Whatever else silks, shutting doors, closing windows. Okay. Um, yeah. Bringing in huge black flats and, you know, bounce, whatever I want to do um, to manipulate the light. And sometimes depending on the room, that might be the best scenario. Mm -hmm. Um, other times it could be the one that takes the most time. And, you know, honestly, and it sounds silly, but, um, I don't know what kind of insurance policy you take on, on shoots with you, but, um, I've, I've had instances where things have gotten broke on photo shoots and rugs have gotten damaged and mm. walls have gotten scratched and lots of little things like that, you know. 20 plus years doing this. Uh, you, just so, to clarify, you have a policy that you get for every shoot or do you have a blanket just policy? Just a blanket okay. policy. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. I only had to use, it a, couple, say, only had to use uh, it a couple of times, but yeah. 
you know, do I want to be in a situation sometimes where I have, you know, 12 by silks up or, you know, solids or whatever floating around a room on stands and a bunch of people not really paying attention and I'm blocking all the light doing this and that and somebody might snag on the edge of something and it falls over and mm. goes through a you know hundred thousand dollar painting on the wall like no i don't want that to happen so sometimes i'm like you know or do i want you know the velcro side of a scrim gym pole in this room with these silk curtains maybe not <laughs> <laughs> you know what i mean so you know i have mm. to kind of like so how can I get around this without manipulating the natural light? If, you know, can I use this other tool? Can I do it this way? And um, maybe save myself a little headache on the mm. setup and breakdown part of it. Maybe move a little quicker. Mm -hmm. um, so that comes into S play. Send somebody ahead to prep some stuff comes, for it. Yeah, 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 yeah. It totally comes into play. I do always work with an assistant. Um, I feel that's that, that really helps the flow and helps me get the shots done. And, you know, I'm getting old. I got bad knees. So. <laughs> Not anymore. So, yeah, right. yeah. yeah, new need, new need <laughs> right. today. Um, but anyway, so that's it's my process. Evaluate the natural yeah. light. Try to use that if I can. Um, and if I want to go another direction, then I flip into that mode and, and get there pretty quickly. How do you decide, uh, I, you know, we talked briefly that you have gotten out an old, you know, I, I can't remember which, which camera you said it was an old Fuji. Yeah. Uh, what are the, are those just for fun or are those you're actually doing legit shoots well, with those or what's the story with those? It's kind of this, um, you know, I, I have a lot of internet friends. Yeah. <laughs> my, uh, my Instagram, uh, my, my, my friend group that I've never met in person, but there are some people that I talked to that uh, there's, there's a definitely a renaissance, um, among architecture photographers, especially that are shooting a lot of film. Mm. And I see a lot of interior photographers who are shooting it. Some people that I follow that, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a freeing type of experience. If you haven't shot film, I, mm -hmm. I highly recommend doing it a few times. I've got a Canon AE one that I bring with me it's everywhere. Perfect. But it's perfect. Try doing a shoot on it for once. Yeah. You know, I've done a few shots with it, not a full shoot with it though. Well, you don't have to replace the digital, just yeah, shoot yeah. it alongside. Yeah. So yeah. No, I, I do, trust me. <laughs> I, um, I'm not savvy enough with film to, uh, take that kind of risk. Yeah. I think it's more of a, of a curiosity to see, what the film sees versus what my digital processing sees mm. because you know I, we're in this generation now where I, I was joking with with somebody just kind of getting frustrated with um the look of digital images now i feel like um you know i said there's a bunch of uh, professional retouchers moonlighting as architecture photographers um because i feel like the post-processing comes ahead of the image creation it, well, you know, it does. Unfortunately, yeah. I think because look, it, um, you know, and I can I can speak to this experience because I I do heavily. So here's here's what's interesting about me that I'm just now discovering that I never realized before is that I've always relied on retouching. Mm -hmm. um, but <laughs> I, if I go back and I look at the original image, all I've really done in the retouching is just a bunch of cloning. Yeah. You know, it, it, it doesn't look too far off from what I originally shot, which is interesting to me because yeah. I, I thought I was doing all these things because I've seen tutorials where you're supposed to be doing this color cast removal here and these particular processes here and luminosity masking here and there. But it's like, well, I could have just pushed my shadows and highlights a little bit yeah, and I would have came to almost the same results, less mm -hmm. of a little bit of cloning. So I'm coming to this place now where I'm realizing that I don't need to do as much retouching as I originally thought. Just general cleanup usually yeah. does a trick. Which is what I, how I feel. But unfortunately, um, the clients don't feel that way anymore. Like now we're, we're, we're coming up against a lot of clients with a lot of crazy retouching requests. Mm -hmm. Like insane, insane retouching requests that I feel like, um, you know, people have, they've experienced with retouching on their phones. They have retouching basic retouching on their apps they can use um they see it they know we can do stuff mm -hmm. um they've heard it from other photographers whatever but i get the craziest this 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 search for perfection from some clients that just drives me insane it's like i i i can't go there like it's you know i don't want to i don't want it to look like that mm -hmm. i don't want it to be so perfect and are you are you experiencing that though even with your clientele yeah yeah really? yeah, yeah. 
It's crazy. Not everyone. Not everyone. Yeah. I mean, it just depends. But uh, enough enough to where it's it's um it's forced me to get better at Photoshop, which annoys me. Mm. Like I don't want to be Mister Photoshop. Yeah. You know. So in terms of shooting film, I think film is a sort By of. By the way, reaction. you better tell everybody you don't need a retoucher, so they don't have to start spamming you. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, so. There's, you know, everything that's going on with AI and rendering right now is insane. Like it blows my mind. I think I follow some renderers out there and it's just amazing. Like I, I, I see the work and I'm like, God, that's so good. Like, yeah. it's just amazing. Like it's feels right. It looks right. It's, it's a dream, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's perfect in every way, but it's not real and it's too perfect. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and I feel like there's this weird moment where a photograph that we can take digitally and retouch crosses into that realm of mm -hmm. where it's so retouched, it's so good, it's so perfect that it starts to become a render. Mm -hmm. And it's not, it's not reality. It's a fake sky. It's a fake window view. It's a fake this, a fake that. It's everything's been cloned out. The fabric's yeah. been fixed. Everything. All the color Frequency separation removed. on yeah. the sheets and, you know, whatever. Like, there's no, you know, it's like nothing is real anymore in the shot. So, anyway, I think shooting film is just sort of a, it's a response to being a little bit frustrated with the, pursuit of perfection and the retouching realm of, of my images. And I just want to see recently I did a shoot where I just, you know, did my shot digitally, was happy with it, plopped the film camera over, did one frame hmm. and just doing one frame was so pleasing. Just like, <laughs> are you using any of those then? Uh, no, I haven't gotten them back yet from okay. the lab yet, but I'm really curious to see the difference and maybe I'll do like a little Instagram story or something on it. But, um, I do want to share the results. When I, I, I do think that would that. be really insightful and, um, maybe even helpful for people. Cause I think that, okay, I just picked up, a, like I said, I picked up an AE one just because I wanted to have a film camera. Yeah. Like part of me was feeling, I don't want to say I was feeling guilty. Um, but I was start like, I was starting to feel like this um, sense of responsibility almost like it was internally. I wasn't really talking about this to anybody, but it's like, I know how to do photography as photography is today, but it's like, well, I really couldn't explain what's actually happening though. Yeah. And not that you need to do that to be a professional or to be able to work. But at some point I learned all the Photoshop tricks I needed to do. I learned how to compose. I, I basically learned all I wanted to learn at that point, except for how photography actually works. Yeah. And how to not rely so much on Photoshop. So it's like, maybe I'll pick up a film camera and just play around with it and see if I can get an exposure correctly. Yeah. So that I, ha I had to look up. Well, the exposure is the easy part. Well, it is, but you know, um, depending on what you're shooting. Yeah. Right. So like I had never, I was never familiar with his own system. So I did a little research on like all the old school stuff, yeah. like, and look, the whole zone system, all those guys did back in the day, mm -hmm. learn how to use that. I don't know if I did very good with it because, but, it, but yeah. it's like using, using like old school tools to kind of like better understand. And I got to say, there's times where even now it's like, I, I can look at a scene and I can say, okay, well, where's my, where's my middle spot? And maybe I'll expose differently. I'm not going to expose based on what my meter on the camera says. Well, yeah, film and talking about the zone system is interesting, but honestly, like, Color negative film. I never even touched that stuff. So no has idea. so much latitude. So whereas black and white is not as it doesn't have the nearly the the light black and white you have to be a little bit more precise with, yeah. and also how it's processed. But color negative film, you can literally be six stops off your exposure and still have a great exposure. Hmm. So you can be wildly off over maybe not as much under on an exposure and get a great image. So, so it should, film should not scare anyone away. Like film is the easiest thing to shoot compared to digital. It's okay. super easy. This is coming from a place of an experience. Be gentle. Is color negative, is that on a roll? Uh-huh. You yeah. just pl plop it into a film camera? Yeah. 
Okay, yeah. so it's like a normal 35 millimeter roll or, okay. Yeah, yeah. Just like if you buy a little, one of those little disposable cameras, you got to roll a 35 millimeter yep. color negative film in there. So. Okay, and then so you get the, you, you take the photos, mm -hmm. you send them off to a lab. Mm -hmm. You get scans back or you get the eggs back. So yeah. so with the scans, how, how are you recovering maybe lost highlight details if they're yeah. already processed? Well, because you, you were you were saying you've got six stops roughly of safe space. So I'm just well, so you you basically are getting a a digital version, a scan of your negative, right? Okay. You're not getting a bracket. You're not getting a raw file where you can push and pull shadows and highlights that much. I mean, right. you're, you're basically getting a flattened TIFF. Okay. That's it. Right. So, and but what? So, so what I'm asking. You can though, add a little contrast to it. Okay. You can you can tweak the color a little bit, but you don't have the control that a raw file has. So. So, but okay. So I'm just trying to understand the six stop thing. So I understand. So it's just well, that's it has, just an exposure thing. It has more dynamic range in a single frame, is what you're saying. Film has more of a dynamic range. Um, sort. I mean, some of these higher end uh, digital cameras now. Have like 15 stops dynamic range or more 16. So you're, you're, you're coming close to film, but what, what's the beauty of film is, you know, from your highlights, to your shadows, you're, you're on a, on a negative, you're, you're saving information in both your highlights and your shadows. So you're kind of like shooting log and video mm -hmm. like that's film. Like okay. film is basically like shooting log. Like you're, 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 you're squashing that, that file down to you're compressing it to get the, you're, you're keeping that information and in the highlights and shadows. Okay. Like when you would get, when we'd get scans back from the lab, literally the, if you opened up your curves or you opened up your histogram, your, your blacks were like plus 15 and your whites were like 240, somewhere around there. Okay. And that was like the parameter they would set. So like you could just start with your levels open and, you know, if you wanted a little bit more contrast, you could start to play with it that But they way. have to do that in the lab, in the process. The scanning of it. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. So you can essentially send them, let's just say we're, for the sake of, we're in this room, you take a color negative frame of mm -hmm. this room, you just give them directions, hey, I want to make sure you pull in a little bit of this. You don't get many up. directions. No. Okay. See, this is my digital mind trying to wrap my head around how this works because. No, you don't, you don't control any of that. Um, you can do it through manipulating the lighting on your own or um, we're so used to thinking of post-production. Yeah. So we, when, <laughs> yeah. We, when we look at a scene yeah. in digital land as interior photographers, we're like, okay, um, I'm going to need an exposure for that. I'm going to need an exposure for that. I'm going to need to flag that. I'm going to need this. Yeah. And that. So you're building the shot based on like how many problems you have in the room. Yes, exactly. So, and you're yeah. like, okay, I can do this in six shots. Yeah. Um, film, you're like one shot. Six shots and some frequency separations. <laughs> a lot of, a lot of pushing and pulling. Some luminosity. Mass. Yeah. But with film, that's the beauty of it. It's like you, the, every film stock has its own way of interpreting the light. So there's, there's films that are lower contrast. There's films that are more saturated. There's films that see color different than, you know, one brand, a Kodak is different than Fuji, different than Agfa. Like, so you would fall in love with the film stock. So when you look at presets, like when you buy like an action set or something like that, and they have all the different film stocks. I mean, that's because film all looks different. All the different brands have a different look to it. So, you know, the way that negative film interpreted the light is how the, the image would turn out. Mm. So it's like a neutral base. So um, you can get away with really bad mixed lighting. You do the way the color shifts happen on film. It's prettier than digital. Mm. It's weird. There's, there's a lot of beauty to film. So anyway, I'm excited to shoot it again. <laughs> well, I'm excited to see, see, cause now you've got me thinking about it more. It's like, yeah. um, I didn't intend to take this conversation down the film route. But yeah, I think we, we started there. Well, I know, but I think it's, I think, well, that's true, but I think it's, a, I think it's, a, I don't know. It's an important conversation to have. I think. I guess something everybody should, should play with it. I mean, yeah. if you call yourself a photographer, you got to shoot film. Yeah. Once. Well, I mean, there's going to be a million people argue with you about that, but I, I, for, I think I well, agree it, with you. I do think I agree with you. on I, it. Well, I think it's a great, uh, you know, um, kind of years ago, somebody was like, um, there was a, these 
Oh, it was back in the wedding days. But people were like, okay, imagine like they would do these competitions where they would these they would they would get like a um, they used to have compact flashcards that were like two hundred and fifty two hundred fifty megabytes, megabytes. Yeah, megabytes, yeah. right? Yeah, and um, you could only get like twenty frames or something on a yeah. on one of those cards with the camera. I, I like, still or, keep one in my in my bag. Yeah, and. Yeah. Um, Anyway, so people are like, okay, you only you can only use this card for like you had it was like challenge yourself like and this is just trying to challenge yourself like shooting film like imagine shooting with your digital camera and you turn the EVF um, reading off so it's not giving you the readout of your exposure. Mm -hmm. um, turn the LCD off on the back so you can't evaluate your shots and you shoot JPEG. That's like shooting film. Hmm. But not as much dynamic range through shooting JPEG. Yeah. So. But for the most part, yeah, I see what you're saying. That's interesting. There was a documentary actually I watched uh, several years ago. There's a photographer, Jim Brandenburg. Uh, he's a National Geographic photographer, retired. But he, uh, there's a documentary made about him where he basically shot uh, for 90 days straight. He shot one single image every single day for 90 days straight. Um, and, you know, that was all all on film as well. So it's yeah. like, I think doing little challenges like that, even if it's just, just carrying around a, a film camera with yeah. yourself and just seeing what happens could be, I don't know. It could be a good practice for us. There's our cue to take a break. We, we took a quick break, but you were showing me your old uh, film camera. Yeah. It's okay. <laughs> uh, you were showing me your old film camera. Um, and I didn't record it or anything, but it kind of makes me want to get one. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. Like, well, that's a really cool one. Yeah, like they're not all that cool. Just the, the mechanics of that, just exactly, yeah. being able to—I don't know. I just you could feel that. Yeah, and I don't know how else to explain it. It's it's well, it's like a four by five camera, and I think that's that's the the appeal to using a four by five. It, it's a lot of people don't understand it until the first time they actually are looking through the ground glass of a four by five. Mm -hmm. How amazing like that whole experience is. Yeah, it's different than looking through a little digital viewfinder or looking at it on your cam range or on your iPad. Yeah. So, and I didn't even, uh, I didn't take an exposure or anything. I didn't see the result. I can only imagine it only gets a little more, uh, magical as you go through the entire process. Yeah. I mean, it, if you can imagine taking a picture of something and not seeing the picture for a couple of weeks mm -hmm. and then seeing it and you're like, Oh, that, that could even be a good experiment for us as well. Yeah. Like, there was, I heard about some photographers putting uh, gaffer's tape over the back of their LCD, even just to, like force themselves into a, I don't know, trying trying to be better photographers doing these yeah. experiments and stuff. So, yeah. what do they call it? Chimping. 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 Is that what it's called? Is that the term? Used to, they used to call it chimping. Okay. Um, take a picture and look. Take a picture and look. Take a picture and look. Oh yes, yes, <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. But it, it's so. you know it does make it easy, and I think again it's not that I felt guilty, but I was like feeling kind of a little bit of a responsibility to maybe learn that because I was not getting burned out, but I was doing real estate photography for the longest time, and I learned how to get by, mm -hmm. and I wasn't expanding my you know knowledge at all. Again, I so so I picked up a film camera. I read up on like the zone system, how that worked. I tried using that. So I can walk into a scene and I can like identify zones. Yeah. And that's not super helpful now because we have the digital tools that we need. But you know, it's it's funny, there's these uh I wasn't sure I was gonna go down this route, but I'm I'm going to. There was a uh there's a course that came out recently teaching about um real estate photography. It came out over the last okay. few years. And I'm part of this group, this Facebook group, and there's a lot of members in it. And literally every single day there's questions on like how to use a camera, um, like very basic functions. Yeah. Like what F stop should I use or, uh, what do you focus on? People giving advice on like how to, how to, how to not see snow in the frame, bump your ISO up higher, you know, just these, these things that just aren't true. And it's like, they're not teaching photography at all anymore. No. Um, it was kind of where I was going and it's, it, it's, I don't want to say like photography as we know it is, is in danger, but just some of the things we've talked about so far in this conversation, designers are expecting more Photoshop retouching or clients in general are expecting more retouching. Mm -hmm. Um, the tools are becoming easier to use. We do have AI 
uh, coming into the picture. Um, in some cases it can be a great tool for us and we use some of those tools, but you know, do you feel threatened at any, by all this stuff that's happening or do you, are you still pretty comfortable with the skill set and what, and what you offer to your clients? I, th- I think if I was at a certain level, like, um, let's just use uh, real estate photography as an example. Um, and I've wondered this, but you know, I mean, I, iPhones are getting so good, mm-hmm. right? Um, I've shot photos with my iPhone. Yeah. So for a real estate listing, I don't see why you, why you couldn't, um, what's to stop a realtor from walking through a house with their iPhone shooting every room horizontal with a wide angle lens on it, throwing it all into an AI engine and say, I want all these corrected. I want it all to have a warm, sunny look. Well, they do that right now. They, they send them to a service called Box Brownie that's in Australia. So real t- And they market directly to realtors. So realtors are already starting to do that. But imagine yeah. this being on your phone as an app yeah. in a year or less. And it's probably already out there for all I know. You know, yeah. and then the, you get these images back. Um, they look great. And boom, uploaded instantly. And, you know, where's the need for the real estate photographer? I don't know. Yeah. So... At a certain level, I feel threatened by it because I think certain things are going to become a lot easier. Um, I think styling is going to change. I think we're going to be able to add things in post and AI pretty easily. Mm-hmm. Virtual know. staging is already... Exactly, You, you can yeah. do a really good job with a lot of that yeah, stuff. Yeah, I just saw a new program on, on Adobe about it. It was kind of fascinating. Um, from a real estate photography perspective, I think real estate well, photography is threatened. But what about from an interiors photographer perspective? Are you feeling I've, that kind of pressure? I, I feel like there's more choices because there are a lot more people that are getting into interiors. I think um, the barrier for entry is super low, so it's open to anyone. I think you you have a great you know system camera eye, whatever you you can get in. Um, what I am starting to see is a separation of photographers who are artists who are starting to dictate the look and style of the trends in the space. And those are the people that I'm inspired by. And I feel like designers are starting to become inspired by, and they're looking for this unique point of view from certain photographers that can bring it. Um, and it's, it's all about vision and composition and, and lighting and technique and, and, how the final file looks if you're pushing it through a, you know, post-processing engine a certain way. Um, but you're, you're coming up with this style that's, that's completely, um, different and unique. It's like you look at, a you know, these real estate photography to use as an example. Um, is there one real estate photographer that, has a style that's unique. I would, there's okay. There are a couple. Um, Andrew Romasco is a good friend of mine who I would consider because he treats every real estate shoot like an architectural photography shoot. Mm-hmm. So there's exceptions. Um, there's, there's other, um, it, again, they're like kind of on the higher end. Yep. Ex- it's, it's the exception. Like there's very few that I, that I'm aware of at least. Yeah. Um, but I would I know, imagine. I, I know that, me, per, sorry, to interrupt, yeah. uh, personally, like now, anytime I shoot real estate, I'm not, I'm charging my, not quite my normal rate, but I'm charging a significant amount for it. So I'm not shooting much real estate anymore, but mm-hmm. I'm shooting it with more care yeah. than I was when I was doing the run and gun stuff. But I, but I think also in a genre like real estate photography, you're, you're, you're trying to showcase something in a certain way that yeah. is consistent. It's, it's information. It's, it, it is, it yeah. is. And you're selling a product, you're selling a house. Um, so maybe a little less wiggle room for being artistic Mm -hmm. in that genre. So interiors is open to anything. Um, You could approach it from a thousand different directions. We didn't talk about it during this recording. We were talking about it a little earlier and I don't know that we ever finished that thought, but, um, and I, and you'll have to maybe reiterate what you were thinking because I I can't quite remember, but it was something the effect of like, there's a lot of, um, you're going to have to correct me because this is not what you said, (laughs) but, I'll see where you're going. In, in my head, I'm like, there's a, not a, not necessarily a right way to do interiors photography, but there's this new in, like Instagram inspired in, interiors photography that's happening. Do you remember that conversation we were? Ha- I can't again. I, 
it's almost like it's not so much focused on, I don't remember how we were having the conversation, but it was, you know, people can walk around and just like photograph cute details and. Well, I think, I, well, okay. So, you know, I try to explain to people, you know, some people are like, oh, you shoot architecture. I'm like, no, I don't shoot architecture. I shoot interior. So like, oh, you know, and they don't understand what, what that really is. And I think there's, there's so many sub sets of what we do, um, classifications of, of, of kind of styles and, and, and clients that we all work for. But I feel interiors photography right now, um, a lot of people don't understand what it is. And basically it is, um, it's, it's, it's creating these, these moments and telling these stories for these designers, um, you know, of these projects that they're doing and these homes and, um, what is telling story? It's, uh, you? you know, it's, there's, there's, there's a, there's a softness to it. There's a, um, there's like a life to it. There's a reality to it. There's, um, uh, it's, it's just, uh, there's a beauty to it, you know? And I, I think that, uh, that's what draws people to interior photography. I think it's, it's a lot of photographers who are seeking to create these beautiful images of these beautiful things mm -hmm. and be surrounded by this. It's, it's, you're surrounded by, you know, amazing pieces of furniture, art, fabrics, uh, architecture. Um, you want to just document it in a way that's, that's gorgeous, you know, that's, that's pretty. And it's, you know, maybe a little bit more, uh, feminine, soft. Um, I think maybe that's, you know, yeah, I think maybe that's where the conversation was going. Cause we were talking about how interiors photography, like some people view it as just walking around with a 50, and getting little small details like that's There's, not that's a part of it that's part sure. of it but that's not what it is and it's it's like it's be, it's become like this instagram thing where like even like i don't have many interior design clients yeah. but i've talked to a few of them and it's really important for them to get the instagram shots more than it is to get the uh, you know they want the vertical shots of the little vignettes mm -hmm. you know it's so I think, I don't know, again, we didn't really finish the conversation cause we were talking about a number of different things, but yeah. you know, I was just curious about your thoughts on that. Like the, the, the direction that things are going with interiors photography. Well, I like, think we're all, we're, I mean, every, I mean, I'm, I'm looking for the Instagram shots when I'm shooting, you know, mm -hmm. I would call them my hero shots. You know, I'm looking for the hero or I used to, la I used to always call them covers. That's a cover. That's a cover, mm -hmm. you know, like that's, you know, the shot of the day kind of thing. And, um, you know, if you can deliver an image that can go viral for one of your clients on Instagram, you're, you're golden, you know, like that's, mm -hmm. that's, you've won. It's, it's an amazing it's an amazing thing to see happen when your client's super stoked because they're getting this crazy engagement on a, on a photograph you did. And, you know, they see more value in you and they want to use you more and whatnot. It's, it's like you saw this shot and it just everybody else sees what you saw and, and enjoys it and likes it and shares it. So um, we, we are, you know, product of this Instagram age where we all, you know, are, are looking for these hero moments and shots, but you know, you do also have to, you know, got to get the, the boring stuff too, as yeah. part of your job. But, um, you always, always have to be seeking out like the beauty in a, in a project. And it could be, you could be on the side of a room shooting this obscure angle of the way that the, you know, the back of a chair is leaning up against the window and it doesn't even make sense, but that's the shot, you mm -hmm. know, it's like the light, the composition, everything is perfect. So you have to open your mind up to see those opportunities in a, in a shoot. And I think you're seeing more and more photographers getting into it who see the beauty in an interior space versus the starkness of like just documenting a space for mm -hmm. what it is. I think you've, you know, we've, we've moved past that. I think the, the successful photographers that you see in interiors are the ones who are, finding that that balance between documenting the space and the softness and the beauty of it you know whether it's the light or it's the choice of what they're how they're shooting it or, you know tools are using whatever to get there where do you think the um if you had to put a number on it the importance of understanding lighting and creating light and, and manipulating light where does that fall it's, it's cr very crucial um what is it? You have to know the rules to break the rules, mm, isn't it? Yep. 
Okay. Yep. That old saying. Um, and I think it's true with, with shooting interiors or architecture. You, you really, you really should do yourself the service of learning the tools of the trade and how they work and how they can work for you. Um, doesn't mean you have to use them all the time, but you know, mm -hmm. they really come in handy and you, you can change the way that you, you look at something. Um, it just brings light, brings energy. It brings excitement. It can bring a mood. It tells stories. Yeah. And, uh, you know, to me, um, yes, you can, you know, you got to learn how to manipulate the natural light. You got to learn how to bend the photons coming out of a pro yeah. photo head. <laughs> if only there was an easy way that people can learn that these days. Yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> Not that we came here just to promote what you're about, to, what we're, you know, what I'm doing out here, but yeah. you're mm -hmm. also doing some workshops. So do you want, are you able to kind of talk about how these things came about and what you're. Yeah. I, I think I've always wanted to teach. Um, I always want to help people. I always like to talk to people about process and um, tools and techniques. I kind of, a, I'm kind of a photo geek at heart. So I've always enjoyed that, that aspect of the, of the industry. Uh, sharing and, and communicating with, with people maybe helping somebody understand something they didn't understand before. And um, this year in January, we decided to, to do a workshop and just specifically focus on lighting. And I don't want to teach composition. I don't want to teach Photoshop. I don't want to teach business, business, all that kind of crap. So it's already out there. That mm -hmm. stuff's already out there. And, you know, a lot of the stuff you got to kind of learn on your own anyway. It's like to make you the photographer you are, you got to, you know, want to understand composition you got to learn it mm -hmm. yourself um there's no rule to that you got to feel it um but lighting is something that i feel like i can teach and i can um got 30 years experience um using lighting in lots of different ways and weird situations so i've kind of come to like i said in the last two to three years a uh, realization of how i use light to my advantage and I just think that there are some easy ways to kind of approach lighting that a lot of people don't really explore or learn on their own. Maybe they're not out there as much. Um, maybe they just don't understand it or they're not explained very well. So um, I'm just having a good time teaching people this process. And it's like, it's just another thing to learn. It's a tool. It's a technique. It's um, like I said, it's not something you need to use on every shot in every instance. Um, I do all natural shots, uh, shoots every now and then. Um, but I think education for me is, um, has been a lot of fun. I didn't realize I would, I would enjoy it as much as I do. Um, it's very time consuming. Uh, but it's, it's something that I really want to spend more time on, um, in the next few months. For some year. reason, I thought you were already doing education, but I guess it was just the, the mentoring, right? And the coaching. We started coaching when COVID pretty much started. Okay. Um, we started doing some coaching and, and that's been great. Yeah. Um, I've enjoyed that. It's actually, um, one of the reasons we went to doing the workshops, um, was because I felt like with coaching, a lot of people were coming to me with lighting questions for mm -hmm. coaching. And it's really tricky to teach someone lighting over a zoom call. Right. You really need to get your hands on and you have to be in the space with the light to understand what it's yeah. doing. You have to, physically do it yourself so it's not impossible yeah. but it's it's uh, better in person mm -hmm. i think yeah and i think uh you're you i know you have plans to do more uh throughout the year so people where yes. can people go to we have an instagram account carlish workshops um you can get there through my account stephen underscore carlish underscore photo i think so complicated anyway that, not a lot of carlish is out there I, I got a, a visual confirmation that is the correct yes lots of underscores <laughs> yeah um but uh on our website as well um we will we do have a um a mailing list uh wait list also, also for the uh for the workshops we do release everything to the wait list first which based on how many people are on our wait list that's kind of filling them up about 90 percent um, so when we do release them on Instagram to the public, there's usually only like two to four seats left. Yeah. And it and seems so. like they've been selling out within an hour. It seems, I mean, maybe it's just my perception, but yeah, that's, it's, it's been great. We haven't, yeah. um, we sold out all of our workshops and, um, maybe they're too cheap. I don't know. What do you think? Kristen? 
I don't know. Well, I mean, regardless there's of the a lot price, of value, yeah, a lot of value. In that, that's what I was going to say. It's like, I think this is something, this kind of information, I think I was telling you, I only know of one other course that's out there that even talks about lighting. And that was an old real estate photography course that Scott Hargis put out back in like maybe 2009. Yeah. And it was dealing primarily with just small speed lights yeah. and some basic uh, manipulation. So I think having something lighting specific for our industry that deals with modifiers and, and things like that is, is going to be really helpful for people. Well, and also using lighting to create beautiful imagery um, and using the lighting as, as your paintbrush, as your source, um, understanding how that works, I think, versus, you know, one thing I'll never discuss in any of my workshops is the term flambient. So it's like, <laughs> you had which to I think it. is a great, which I think is a great, like it first is. time I heard it's, it, I was like, clever. that's a great word. That's yeah, a great word. It's clever. It's just um, kind of a little, yeah, yeah, I'm, I believe in light stands, not, not bouncing a light on every, uh, corner or ceiling in the, in a house. Um, anyway, but, uh, I, I joke, I joke. There's, there's some great, tips and techniques out there that, uh, I've learned a lot from yeah. the real estate market as well. Um, but my approach is completely different. So there's, yeah. there's a huge difference in terms of, um, creating a, uh, just a beautiful image with strobe. And I think a lot of people think it's, uh, they, they do it on their own or they try it and they don't understand it. They get bad results and they think strobe sucks. Um, because they don't, they don't know how to do it. They don't know how to yeah. do it. They yeah. can't, they can't get, the results they want right. out of it and they struggle. And, you know, one of the, one of my students I was talking to, um, he has all the gear, all the gear in the world, fully loaded. I'm like, okay, what's, what's the deal. And, um, and I think what happens is we buy the gear, but we don't practice with the gear and we don't practice to the point where we learn what the parameters are of the gear. Mm -hmm. Like in Photoshop, for example, you, you learn in Photoshop, if you take a Photoshop course, like people teach you to push something beyond what you to do, what you want to do, just so you can pull it back to see where it should be. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Same thing with lighting. Like you have to go beyond what you think is normal to find out where normal is. Yeah. So. Sorry, I, I, I was gonna see if Max was gonna come over here. No. Oh, 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 oh. Should I? Should I? No. Wow. Okay. Mm. So, uh, well, look, I know I've. It's it's way past dinner time. It's eight thirty. Um, we can find a place. Yeah, we'll find a place. So, uh, I guess in summary, like I think what I am kind of taking away from any conversation I've had with you, it's like I think being well rounded and knowing how to create an image you want and having more of a vision instead of having like a, a run and gun process that you stick to every single time, like learning how to manipulate your environment mm -hmm. to like actually create images. Like you can't mm -hmm. do that just with natural light. I mean, you just can't, you can do a lot, you can do a lot, but you, you can't, you can't just create the results you want every single time. You can't create it. You can, you can yeah. capture what's there. It's hard. It's hard to make natural light look like sun if the sun's not out it's hard to make it obey <laughs> but yeah anyway lighting is uh it's a tool it's a trick it's uh it's fun to play with um doesn't hurt anybody yeah um no i i i really enjoy it um yeah. using it as a uh, creative tool and i think yeah. a lot of people once they once they learn how to be creative with it start to use it more yeah. as well. So, all right. Well, thanks for hopping on. Uh, thanks for inviting me in your house and, uh, yeah, I appreciate right. everything you do. And, uh, I look forward to seeing what other things you might come out with in the future. I'm going to convince you to start dragging a strobe around more after you're uh, working with, someone. you know, I always have a strobe with me. I always have <laughs> one with me. It's just a matter of whether or not I get it out. Yeah. I got a little nervous when you said you were, uh, scaling back and going into the Zen, the Zen process of, uh, I think, I'm, I think I want to do more of a hybrid. I want to, I, I want to have that freedom of being able to just like walk around and explore, but I still want to have those controlled images when, when I, when I have, I just, I, I guess I just want to free myself from having one single process that I stick to every single time is, is yeah. kind of what it is. Yeah. You know, I tell people to, you know, to play like uh, shoot a house at night, you know, with one light, you know, see what yeah. you can do. Yeah. I probably won't be doing that anytime soon, but <laughs> it's, it's a fun, it's a fun yeah. way to, to learn how to use strobes. Yeah. Um, you know, I think we, we rely on the ambient a lot. 
I, so. I say that because I don't think I have the skill set or confidence to do anything like that yet. Wow. We're kind of doing it here. Ma- so. That's true. Maybe I just need to attend one of your workshops. And uh. <laughs> so the door is always open. I always have a space for you, Jordan. All right. So anytime. Well, thanks for hopping on and uh, let's go get some dinner. Exactly. All right. All right. Thanks for having me on.